So great to see everybody in the reel. Welcome to those who are watching remotely. Um, unfortunately, my friend Matthew Ball could not join the conference. He had a family issue to deal with, so we have Timu instead. And uh, Timu probably knows more about the metaverse than the three of us put together. But I do want to read something from Matthew Ball's 2020 Metaverse Manifesto, um, which excited a lot of the conversation about the metaverse. Uh, even before we were talking about the meta metaverse, um, that uh, phrase was invented to torture writers. And we just have to repeat it over and over again against our will. But uh, earlier this year, way before the meta metaverse was introduced, Epic Games raised a billion dollars from companies, uh, Sony among them, expressly to use it to help build the metaverse. So uh, Matthew's definition, and we have lots of definitions of the metaverse, and let me stipulate that they are all correct. Um, the metaverse is broadly understood as a successor state to today's mobile internet, but which will involve countless interoperable and persistent virtual worlds, be richly integrated into the physical world as well, thereby creating a new medium for economy, for, and economy for work, leisure, and innovation. Jensen Huang, founder and CEO of NVIDIA, said he believes the metaverse economy will eventually exceed the economy of the physical world. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg himself says the metaverse is the successor to the mobile internet, a fully embodied uh, internet where we look at the web from the inside out. And we'll, we'll drill down on that idea of fully embodied uh, internet. And then Jesse Schell, who wrote the book on game design, says that the metaverse is a virtual world containing other virtual worlds. The commingling of virtual objects and worlds with reality, which has also been mentioned by the meta company. And then finally, Scott Galloway took the stage Friday and he says, this is all hooey. He says, we're kidding ourselves that Apple, with its all-powerful app store, uh, will win and will always win. Uh, and that certainly is true that the, uh, what Apple is doing in augmented and virtual reality hangs over the industry like the sword of Damocles potential, with the potential <laughs> to change everything. Uh, and of course, Mark Zuckerberg was here himself yesterday uh, reinforcing the notion that his social media company was going to become a social meta company. Uh, so, uh, Raffaella, is Professor Galloway wrong? Is, is, I mean, this is not a fad, right? We're going to be talking about this for a while. No, 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 this is not a fad. And, uh, you know, you're absolutely right. We've been around for 30 years, going on 31. And our goal has always been very clear. And it is not just to build the metaverse ourselves, but it's to help all creators build towards an open metaverse. We do that you know, by providing tools, libraries, APIs, uh, social experiences, and also trying to create this uh, economy that is fair to, uh, that is fair to, to creators. I, I think, look, um, there are social experiences, social platforms rooted in gaming that are already very large, and you could say that that is kind of like the beginning of what the metaverse is. Suddenly, we're only just scratching the surface of what does it really mean to carry your digital persona in these worlds? What does it mean to move across worlds, to move the things that you own across these different worlds? And what does it mean and what does it look like when virtual and physical worlds start um, touching each other and how do they affect each other? Uh, but having said that, the tools uh, to create these worlds, to create the metaverse, actually have been around for at least 25 years. They all come from gaming. Um, the, the, the types of interactions, the social interactions, social entertainment, all comes from, from games, and also the, the tools, the engines, uh, to build all that come from that. They've been around for 25 years, they've been used, and so why yeah. not? I, I, I agree with this general idea that games are going to lead the way, and that's what people are, are doing in, in VR right now. So, Philip, you created the first metaverse, at least by my definition. Uh, it's got a thriving economy. Yeah. It's got almost a million people who have a persistent monthly presence. Uh, and it was also, at the same time, one of the first social networks. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, certainly the Second Life gives us a look ahead uh, at, a lot, at a bunch of this stuff. C certainly one of them is the idea of changing the social network itself to be defined by place rather than by connections between people. And I think that's an ongoing kind of design conversation as to how we'll work. And it, you know, what it makes me think, Charlie, is that 
we're still in this early stage, as, as Rafael has said, it is, this is definitely all happening. There's a ton of stuff happening here. I would say that the, uh, the waiting game is tied to the fact that, as, as you mentioned with the social network, we've all got to be meaningfully present in there in a way that we're all comfortable with in the same way that we're comfortable, say, sending text messages to each other on WhatsApp or something like that. So uh, that, that, I think, is one of the you know, fun things to talk about, which is you know, how close are we to that? Like, for example, look at MetaHuman, which we were just talking about, you know, uh, this amazing engine for creating people that is probably near enough to photorealistic to be usable. Is that something, you know, we can get a thousand people in a conference room as avatars? But I think this, the, the social connection is at least part of the whole deeper answer of why we would go there anyway, you know, whatever that metaverse thing is. It has something to do with all of us being there together. Well, Timu, um, you have created uh, an avatar system that is used by over 900 games, uh, including uh, the social game, if you will, VR chat. Mm -hmm. So how central is this idea of being fully, having a fully embodied presence, and by fully embodied, I mean you're represented by an avatar? Right. Yeah, I mean, like how we think about the metaverse, you know, it's a 3D space, 3D virtual space, where you are represented as an avatar. So avatar is like, um, you know, a version of yourself that you use as your metaverse identity. So it's a super essential part. And, and we think, you know, that's kind of the spatial experience of being in a place uh, is what makes, you know, something a, a metaverse or, or a virtual world, right? Um, like we discussed yesterday, it's the difference between kind of internet and metaverse, right? What's, where do you kind of draw the line? So I think it could also be a 2D experience that is kind of spatial and you can feel that there's space and you can move around and stuff. It doesn't have to be a 3D world uh, in that sense, but, but yeah, avatars are, are an essential part of that. And what we are working on is like making avatars portable across worlds. And that's actually 1,600 companies now <laughs> that use our avatars. So you can travel across all these worlds with one avatar. Um, and I think you know, what's kind of missing from making the current also gaming world, aside of the experience of like having a closer social connection, what makes that into the metaverse is like having more connected worlds, having more consistent experience across many different virtual worlds that you can visit. Um, and there are kind of many services and kind of layers that need to be built for that, and avatars are, are, is one of them. So, um, yeah, it, it, we, we believe it's a very important part of, of that world. Quick question, Philip, uh, just to follow up. When you were building Second Life in the early 2000s, it was released in 2000? It was released in 2003, went into sort of alpha in 2002, yeah. And were you thinking that it was a metaverse? What were you, what were you calling it? How did it, that you're thinking about it evolve? Well, we had, re we had read the book, <laughs> which I, I think we're all going to hear about next. We had read the book uh, that so many people refer to as the you know, kind of foundational uh, instruction manual or whatnot uh, for the metaverse. That, that had come out in 91. So I, as a, as a kid, had been really, really obsessed uh, before the book came out, you know, before Snow Crash, before I, I'd really read most of these things, with the idea of like, what if you redid the laws of physics inside a big space? that was somehow a computer simulated space that we could all go in and make stuff. So it was kind of more this, uh, the, the, the original aspiration for Second Life as a metaverse was as a creative space where you would find all these remarkable things that people had made. And interestingly, from the very beginning, we felt that it needed um, the right kind of you know, portability for objects, live creation, and then the right kind of legal and currency and governance regimes to allow people to be as creative as they possibly could. Because you, know, you so, needed an economy for the yeah. creators to be compensated. Mm -hmm. I felt that was one of the things that I think was unique about what I felt strongly about at the time and, and even quite you know, some time ago was that there needed to be an economy um, and there also needed to be you know, forms of governance perhaps separate from that. But, but all of that would emerge from the activities of the people that were in there. And so I think that was kind of a founding principle to the to the, to the work we were doing. The creator economy, of course, is something that Meta is talking about a lot. Um, they've created this virtual world uh, called Meta Horizon. Uh, they are you know, actively trying to recruit and train builders. They've hired many of the builders or are otherwise subsidizing them. And it, you know, the secret of the social internet, and this was true when I was at AOL in the 90s, right, was the content that was popular was the content created by other people. 
And AOL, Charlie, let me just say, if I remember correctly, if we go back through the annals of time, right, there, there are little versions of all this stuff back through history. And in fact, AOL did any number of kind of place e you know, hang out -y experiments as well. Those was ones that were Oh yeah, vir we, did, we did virtual places in 1997 and we're always trying to figure out how to make people feel co-present on the internet, right? Because right? surfing the internet is a very, very individual uh, bespoke experience that you make for yourself. But when you go onto social media, th those are all experiences and links and opinions that belong to other people and it's very addictive because the killer app is other people. Right. So, Rafaela, you know, we're talking about the creator economy and uh, Epic Games is, is known to at least people inside the industry, not as the maker of Fortnite, but as the maker of Unreal Engine. And Unreal Engine, along with another company called Unity and, and several others, um, are, are called game engines because they're used to create games or, or game levels. And the game levels can be used as movie sets. The game levels can be used uh, to be the basis of virtual worlds. People are talking about um, developing systems where they can stream the real-time content yep. uh, from uh, Unreal Engine yep. uh, through the cloud to somebody's browser. So these are really, really exciting developments. So what kind of tools is Unreal Engine developing, again, to help those creators uh, and help them monetize their vision? Yeah, so Unreal Engine um, you know, came out in the late 90s. Uh, it was a game originally that we were producing and then we decided that that same engine could be reused to power our games. To this day, Fortnite and all our games run on that. But also that we could give it to other creators to help create their games, their experiences, whatever else it might be. Um, uh, so Unreal Engine, we actually provide uh, free to download, uh, free for creators to use unless it's a game, then we take uh, a percentage, a small cut of that. Uh, but it's, uh, it's rooted in making sure that any creator can build as easily as possible. Unreal Engine 5 is coming out shortly. Uh, we're very proud of it. Uh, we provide it with open source code, uh, so we are as open as we possibly uh, can be. In addition to that, we also have Capture Reality, for, um, for capturing uh, environments in high fidelity, tree motion to import uh, CAD models and then create environments in that sense, and obviously the MetaHuman creator uh, that we were just talking about to create digital humans, highly, highly realistic and responsive digital humans in uh, now going down from sometimes weeks to now a matter of minutes sometimes. And all of this is done together with the libraries of assets. We have five or six different libraries of assets. All of this is done really to make sure that creators have the easiest time possible to uh, really imagine the world and imagine what they, what they might want to create um, and, and, and really help create what this metaverse is. Well, and also you've created building tools in Fortnite which are simpler. Correct. an Unreal Engine so that um, people can start to build uh, Fortnite experiences and islands and maps themselves. Correct. Going back to creators themselves, uh, in, there is a difference between Fortnite, Fortnite Battle Royale, and Fortnite Creative, as we call it. And Battle Royale, think of it as our own TV show. We mm -hmm. write the book, we write the chapters, we determine what happens next. Always with the with obviously the users, the players making a difference there. But uh, in addition to that, we have Fortnite Creative, where players can go and create their own games, their own experiences. They already spend more than 40% of their time there, and we are pushing on that more and more to make sure that it's easier and easier to create experiences there, to promote them, to find them, um, and, and that. Well, is there was of great. course that watershed uh, event of Travis Scott on Fortnite, <laughs> which was attended viewed by 47 million people. Yeah, and, and the Travis Scott concert was in, in uh, Battle Royale, but now, as you might have seen, the Ariana Grande was in Fortnite Creative, yeah. the O2 was in Fortnite Creative, and so you'll see us uh, go more that, so, that way. So is Fortnite a metaverse? Uh, I think Fortnite is leading towards uh, the metaverse. It's one of the metaverses. It's one place where you can have Social entertainment, which we, we believe is absolutely important if you're talking about the metaverse, you cannot tell people to go down a list of things to do, but you have to be able to get them to engage with each other, with products, with things, as they're being entertained because they're watching a show or they're watching a, you know, a sport event or maybe they're walking through a museum. And also it provides that uh, level of 
uh, self-digital expression, this ability to carry yourself, whichever way you feel, changing it, modifying it, uh, but really making sure that it's you, and as everybody talked about, the element of social interaction, which is completely different from what's happening on the internet right now. So is, would you call Second Life a metaverse today, Philip? Yeah. I mean, I think that Second Life has the greatest number, but again, going back to what I said, the, 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 what Second Life has proved out experimentally for a smaller audience than what we're, you know, what, what, what Facebook is dreaming about is uh, people being willing to be um, socially present with each other and in fact live, in the case of Second Life, in a virtual world. And that's a big question that we don't know the answer to right now. And in fact, the externalities that have driven a lot of the hype right now around that word uh, have been some very unusual and interesting things. I mean, one of them, Facebook renaming the company, but the other one is just COVID, that we suddenly had a situation upon us that none of us expected where we were confronted by the idea that we might have to move um, a good deal of our social activity um, yeah. online. And we were never, as a human race, you know, we were never really confronted with that before. Yes, some of us play video games online, but the socializing aspect of it, we never had to contemplate that. And I mean, how many people here, I always say, how many people remember 2020, March and April, which were those two months where you made the sad attempts a few times to have happy hour with your friends on Zoom, right? <laughs> yeah. Everyone, right? Not one person is still having, or maybe one, but. Or, or saying happy day. birthday. So the, yeah, so, so, so COVID kind of was this impulsive shock that said, hey, maybe you're all gonna go spend 30% of your socializing time online because you can't risk getting COVID. Uh, and so I, all these companies said, well, I want a piece of that action. If it happens, becomes a business, you know. But it remains this core question. How do we get ourselves into the world? What compatibilities does that infer with respect to content and avatars? Uh, but how do we get ourselves in there in a way that we're all like, okay, I'll do this. And I think that we're, there's a lot of interesting progress toward it. We're certainly going to get there, but I would only observe that we're not there yet. So just to sort of tie a bow around what you and Raffaella were saying is that we're looking at a future of many metaverses. There will not be one big M metaverse that contains everything else, but rather we will have these places that we go that are metaverse-like. My bet would be that the economics of it will be that initially at least there will be successful um, uh, islands of, of metaverse-like experiences which are owned by different companies, much like AOL before the internet. I mean, you're gonna see companies that can really attack this top-down and create something, and at least we'll learn from that. And right. then ultimately, I would say the water will recede and these islands will get connected by bridges, right? And that's really the metaverse. Well, so I, I think the word only means, I, personally, you know, Charlie, we've been talking about this, I think the word doesn't really mean anything with the presumption of there being multiple metaverses. The aspirational word has something to do with a giant place where you can go anywhere in it, you know, as yourself. And so I kind of think the big M version of it is maybe the, at least a more important one to debate on stage. Well, but in, by that definition, then Timu's avatar system is the metaverse. <laughs> is one of the components. Because it's, it's, it's a, sort of a connective tissue between all of these 1600 game experiences. Yeah. I mean, it definitely creates a more consistent kind of virtual experience. And I think that's also like, if there is one big metaverse, but it consists of millions of different worlds built by different developers, but those worlds are sufficiently linked, you know, with, with avatars and services, then that might be the big, um, you know, metaverse. Um, so, yeah, I think, like, if there are ways to link together worlds, there's a bigger chance that this world will happen and then, you know, we'll have a, you know, uh, a big metaverse consists that consists of many different, you know, developers and so forth. Um, if that doesn't happen and the big companies create it, then, you know, they'll obviously uh, are more likely to try to own it and, and you know, have, have their metaverse, right? So that's why I think um, the connective tissues, the connective kind of links between worlds are, are you know, extremely important. Um, how many avatars yeah. do people generally have? Uh, you know, do people who make their avatars through Ready Player Me, yeah. do they change them all the time? Do they make just one? Do they have a hundred that they jump into for different purposes? Can you share something about that behavior? Yeah, so people generally have like an avatar for a use case. So if you use a, you know, like a VR meeting uh, app, for example, you won't have like base tattoos. 
you know, you'll have more kind of professional um, uh, looking avatars and also the developers that built those worlds like want that to be the case. Um, versus if you have like a social avatar for VR chat, you might have a, an extreme version that is not you at all, you know, it, uh, you know, it might be a different gender or not a human at all, like in our case it's human, um, all the avatars so far, but um, yeah, so you'll, ha you'll have different avatars for different use cases. And I think like how we've thought about you know, the avatar creation and, and like the identity, it's kind of similar to a social media profile in a way. Like you create a different social media profile for LinkedIn where you show your professional side, you should, you know, create an Instagram, you get, you have different, different kind of identities. And I think your identity in the internet today is, you know, your social profile uh, in some way. So I think people um, kind of like create their avatars in a similar way, um, like they create their social profiles. And that's why also avatars are curated a curated version of yourself usually. That's what people you now go for. Um, I think there's definitely a place for like hyper-realistic one-on-one kind of copy version of yourself, but that's like more for like um, you know, teleconferencing or like virtual presence, uh, which, yeah. you know. Um, I want the virtual version of me to be 40 years younger and six inches taller. That's right, just saying. that's right. That's, <laughs> that's probably a common request. <laughs> So, um, you know, Charlie, I was just going to answer that too. In, in Second Life, what we see, which is very fascinating and important relative, I think, to where this is all going, is, as Timu said, surprisingly, even though in Second Life you can really uh, have any number of avatars kind of in your pocket, in your inventory, and they're, they're quite easy to mess around with. I mean, it's not like a blockchain thing. You don't have to spend $40 to make an avatar or whatever. It, 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 you can have tons of avatars. But most people have only one. Uh, really, I mean, s strongly, and and I think that's absolutely fascinating. As we as we figure out how to be in these worlds, a learning that we had from Second Life. I at the beginning thought that people would have like many avatars, and they'd be just wildly creative with the you know limits of what they would do with them. But but mostly what people did was they poured an enormous amount of creative energy, which ends up being you know in the case of Second Life, hundreds of hours of work and you know, playing around to make their avatars. I bet this is true in VR chat as well, I wonder, as it, as it grows. But um, it says something about Well, you know, you we were talking about Professor Balenson's research, right. uh, which has shown that you are your avatar. The more time you spend in an avatar, the more time you want to spend as that avatar, it becomes you. So the longer, I think that sort of VR chat, people get into it and it's fun to find all the avatars and to go in and out of them, but then ultimately, yeah. you find the identity that kind of suits you. Yeah, it, it's, the, this is just one of the most fascinating things. And, and by the way, it's hard, for example, on Altspace or in uh, Meta Horizon to change your avatar because you only have one. So you can change the avatar, but then you can only have that one avatar. The one that you had before is erased. It's not in a store or a closet. And also, as the avatars become more and more detailed in their capability, people will just pour in more, more and more energy, as we do in the real world, into iterating and defining and experimenting with what that element should look like for them. So as, as avatars become more sophisticated, as they go towards something more like MetaHuman, you're going to see the, a sort of an exponential increase in people's amount of time they spend getting ready, you know, like creating themselves. Right. Because it goes back to the, the point of uh, digital self-expression. It's not just the way that you look your physical body, but it's how you present yourself. It's what clothes or what skins right. you wear, is how you do your makeup, or how your, your hair might change. And then it can go all the way to the other side. The metahumans, for example, you know, we were talking about it before. Um, you know, originally we created them to make sure that we and other creators can quickly add new characters to a storyline and doing it really fast in a highly photorealistic photo manner. At the same time, when they came out, what uh, most people tried to do was to recreate themselves. Um, so there, there, is a, there is a desire for that, and there are already more than one million metahumans that have already been created, wow. so it's not. And, and what are people doing with them? Uh, well, so you can, you can use them in a variety of different ways, even if you think about just advertising or entertainment. For example, you can create extras with that. You don't have the need to have specific extras anymore. You can control them. You know exactly what they will look like. Uh, you know that they're going to be showing up. They're going to be wearing the, uh, you know, the right clothes and all that. From there, you can go to, to the extreme and anything else. It could be you know, concierge systems or anything else if you want to go on the B2B side. But. So follow-up question. I think we all agree that within the next 
let's say, decade, uh, the internet or the metaverse, if you will, uh, will, will be much more realistic, mm -hmm. much more photorealistic. Uh, do we have the infrastructure really is like 5G? Is that enough or do we need another layer of infrastructure to handle that much compute? Well, we need to make it cheaper for sure. Pixel, pixel streaming right now is, is, you know, is a very good solution, but uh, it's, it's a little bit too expensive. Uh, so that is something that we need to tackle. But. Mm -hmm. So every time I hear Mark Zuckerberg, and he was speaking here at South by Southwest uh, yesterday, as I said, every time I hear him, I mean, I know that they're working on AR, but every time I hear him describe their vision for the metaverse, it sounds like he's talking about the oasis from Ready Player One, just without dystopia. You know, sort of <laughs> as family entertainment, not as dystopia. Um, but do you, do you think, Timu, that, that they're gonna succeed in that? Yeah, um, you know, who knows? But uh, I hope that there will be a more open metaverse, not owned by one company, because I think there's, um, you know, the power uh, of owning that, you know, virtual world that people spend a lot of time in and um, having a lot of control over it, like, can't be good. Uh, it, it doesn't matter which company. You know, if it's one company, one group controls that, that that's going, not going to be a good thing, right? So, um, yeah, so I hope, you know, um, they'll be collaborative as well, maybe. Um, but I also think that people resist, you know. Having... Well, you're bringing up a good topic, which is metaverse governance. Right. Um, and Philip, I think Second Life has had, had quite a bit of experience uh, working with its very, very passionate core audience about this. Yeah, and I think one way of looking at governance choices for the, the metaverse would be that there is a continuum between uh, completely um, decentralized and essentially self-moderating and then completely centralized in its moderation, which really is what a lot of stuff looks like today, although to your point, Second Life doesn't, and some of the other ones don't, don't either. But uh, m most of the virtual systems we have today are centrally moderated in a way that is, in my opinion, you know, clearly not scalable. We, you know, there's no way we're gonna get to a billion people worldwide using something with the moderation system where you send in a trouble report and say, I don't <laughs> like Charlie, he upset me. Uh, take action against him, government. Um, but on the other hand, the flip side of like the blockchain ideas of like literally everything in this city block is written on the blockchain by one lucky owner who uh, is the rent collector with absolute control over that parcel of land with another one next to it. I can tell you from a lot of years in Second Life, that absolutely doesn't work either. You have to have zoning, you have to have communities, you have to have self-moderating communities, you have to have all these things. And I think we'll, uh, yeah, I think that's one of the important things. To the point about whether Facebook, you know, do we hope Facebook makes it? I think the important point to be made, not so much picking on Facebook or Google, uh, those are the two that I think are most responsible for this problem, but the important question is what's the business model for the thing? Um, now, the metaverse business model, I think broadly could be seen as in some, so, some sort of an advertising model, right? where you take what we're doing with advertising today and you extend it into the metaverse. So you have people walking alongside you trying to sell you things, very much the minority report for those who remember that movie, right? Um, the, uh, the problem with that is that it amplifies the problems we already have in social media networks and makes them horrifically worse. And, right. and, I, and I think it's an existential risk without right. question. We have to have a business model for the metaverse that is not compelling, it's not trying to modify people's behavior to make more money. That's the ad business. Here's, here's what I've been uh, talking about recently, which is how do we prevent ourselves from making every mistake we made developing the internet and just taking those mistakes straight to the metaverse, straight to virtual worlds, and repeating them, as you said, and making them much, much worse, right? I mean, we have influence now and influencers who right. can uh, manage the truth for people, but imagine if we can't tell what's real. Because when we talk about photorealism, now we're talking about, I mean, you talk about influence and digital twins and deep fakes. Now, now you can have the whole world as a deep fake, yeah. right? Now you're like descending into the matrix. How about if you're logged off, when you're logged off, your metahuman avatar just acts roughly like you. <laughs> but again, you know, that technically possible, is that what we want? What do you think, Rafaela? How, how can we cooperate our way out of having a fully embodied Twitter? Well, I think it has to be... <laughs> uh, uh, 
I have not. I think it's up to the to the major organizations that, that are building these worlds to have a different ethical st standpoint to start from, and to follow that, and to make sure that users are first and creators are first, and money is a second, or at least money and the economic model is to the benefit of the creators and not for some just um, you know just for one company's gain, so to speak. Well, we, we had a semblance of that at the beginning of the internet, which you know, came out of the Department of Defense and academic institutions throughout the world, yeah. right? So it had a governing body at its very beginning called ICANN. They manage um, domain names and hyperlinks, which is the way we move around inside uh, the internet. Do we need, do you think, Timo, that kind of not-for-profit uh, to really manage our identity and, and keep us safe in the ways that Rafael is describing? Yeah, I have a comment on the uh, business model as well. You know, I think, yep. like, uh, I believe that the better business model for the metaverse is the digital goods. And, you know, Second Life has obviously right. seen that. So, like, um, you know, maybe the best business model in the internet is ads. Uh, but it will be, you know, if you embody your avatar, you live in a virtual world, you're going to want to buy stuff there, right? And uh, a big part of economy from the real world will, you know, translate into that. And, uh, and if that part is big enough, then, you know, people don't need to rely on ads. They don't need to rely on, you know, collecting data on you and then kind of like the, the Web 2 model or, or the current Web model. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's going to, and, you know, we see it in Fortnite, right? Fortnite. Right. It's purely based on digital goods, and uh, there's no like uh, ads or data collection, in, you know, like it is in um, in like social media, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know about the governing body. Like, it's hard to see how like someone can just come together and set rules. But I wasn't there when internet was created, so <laughs> <laughs> I have been you know, some other people. Sorry. <laughs> you know, it, it's it's important to add, Charlie, to, to Timu's point. Look at digital goods. Second Life makes its money from two things. One is uh, sometimes there are fees on the sale of something. So if somebody sells a hat to somebody else to wear on their avatars, there's fees that the company makes. They're typically like quite small, like single digit percentages. And then when people own land in the world, there's a kind of a hosting fee which you pay monthly for the amount of land that you have in the world. Now that model applied for, used with a million people inside Second Life, makes more money per person per year than Facebook does in Instagram, or across, actually across the Facebook business units for advertising. Also, that's more money than YouTube makes sending videos out per person in advertising. So the point is, not only is the digital goods business the ethically right one for this stuff, at least as a starting point, certainly, it's potentially a bigger business. So, you know, the, the whole, oh, but the internet has to be based on advertising, baloney. That is totally not true. There are two companies that have made a ton of money on advertising on the internet. Before that, we didn't even know what advertising was. I started Second Life before there was advertising right. of the sort that we have today on the internet at all. At the same time, I would not want to forget also the, the, the physical goods and the physical and the real world because, yes, we're talking about the metaverse and we're talking about anything that's a virtual world or, 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 a, or a game, uh, so to speak. But there is a connection between that and then buying an item directly at the store. We've seen it with Balenciaga and what we did with that. And we took Balenciaga into Fortnite, but then the, those same clothes were available for sale in a, in a, you know, in a physical environment. And I think that what we still have not figured out is this idea of transmedia or how the two things connect. We have tried here and there, but that will happen more and more. And it's also the idea of putting on AR glasses and being able to see something in addition to the physical world and not just be in one versus the other. So this ties in, this takes us to the topic of virtual land and the crazy prices that people are paying in the central land and in sandbox on the presumption that proximity will matter in the metaverse rather than the what matters on the internet, which is hyperlinks. Correct. But do we think that those people are buying this land as a PR stunt, or can it really work out for them? Timu? Yeah, I mean, we work with a, a bunch of Web3 worlds and, and, and companies, and I think, like, 
it's hard to see if the land you know business model is going to work or not uh, I don't have an opinion on that directly but I think it does show you know um, if you add ownership to digital assets then you know they become valuable right I mean they, they can become more valuable uh, is the current like NFT kind of web3 games market uh, uh, you know too speculative maybe uh, but I think it still shows that um, NFTs and, and blockchain is a potential way to, you know, provide or create ownership of the digital assets. So, um, so follow up then, yeah. uh, is, is an avatar or will an avatar be an NFT? Yeah. So, I mean, I think w what we believe in is like um, ownership is an important part of the metaverse. Like being able to own digital goods, sell them, uh, trade, and, and that's, you know, the foundation of the economy of the metaverse, right? So that is extremely important. And, and I think NFTs, you know, uh, are the best way to solve that problem today. Um, and it's still early and there's lots, lots of problems and, and, and so forth. But as a company, you know, we engage with, like we've, we've done a few NFT drops. There's like accessories on the avatars that, you know, work across all these different games that, uh, that we work with. So, you know, we'll see. Uh, but I think ownership is important and uh, ownership can't be provided by a central party that decides in the end or can re-decide, you know, who owns what. So I think blockchain and NFTs are the best way to do that today. Um, let me share another topic that uh, I wanted to make sure we included in our panel, which is this notion of microtransactions, right? So instead of having to buy a subscription to the New York Times in order to read their articles, the Times charges you a pay as you go. So, oh, you read this story, it's 15 cents. But so far, there's been no way to do those transactions profitably, and so they've been forced into this subscription model. But then you think about things like Travis Scott in Fortnite. If everybody in Fortnite paid 10 cents to go see Travis Scott, you would have made $5 million in 12 minutes. So it seems to me that the economic development of the metaverse is dependent on solving that problem. Am I wrong? No, and, and indeed, I mean, for example, you know, putting a finer point on that. In Second Life, there's about $650 million a year in transactions. That's U.S. dollar value, but the transactions themselves are in Linden dollars, which is a digital currency, uh, not exactly like a blockchain currency, it's different, but it's a digital currency in which everybody can have units of it, and it enables the tran small transactions. The average transaction across all those $650 million in transactions is about $2 in Second Life. Wow. So obviously, if we had to use the blockchain, <laughs> you'd, you'd have to spend another thirty-five dollars uh, to do the transaction to, to to pay for the recording of it on the blockchain, and then if you uh, even if we wanted to use credit cards, right? Uh, once those transactions get small enough, and those are pretty small, you're bearing an enormous cost in that. So we invented an economy and a digital currency um, just out of need because we wanted people to be able to do these small transactions as creators with each other, and and it's weird that, that I mean, that's what led to the Linden Dollar and Second Life, which was in many ways kind of the first experiment in cryptocurrency. So I do agree. I think microtransactions are going to open up an enormous uh, market opportunity because you're going to be able to pay for things in the digital space that are a lot cheaper, basically. And, and there's an, a payment system independent of the platform that you're on, right? So that payment system goes with you and your avatar. Right. It doesn't exist on the platform. You don't have to put down your credit card at every single platform, sort of every time you walk in a door or teleport from place to place. But to enable creators, like we've all been talking about, you have to have a way for people to take money in and out of the system, and when you, you, which, which has been true with Second Life from the beginning. And uh, once you enable people to take money in and out of the system, you have all these problems with, uh, you have all these complicated problems with fraud. Um, and, well, sure, it's and, the best and, money laundering platform ever invented. Right, money laundering. <laughs> and so, like, for example, at Linden Lab, we, because we started with that so long ago, we actually have ended up building a whole subsidiary of the company that most recently announced uh, a, pro a project with Unity where you can uh, essentially plug a, a digital currency using Linden's uh, legal and, you know, machinery and, and add a digital currency to any uh, game in the way that you can add avatars with Ready Player Me. Yeah. So, Rafaela, um, Meta has said that they're working on something that, that we call in the industry the meta layer, right? The meta layer is the sort of place in the technology stack where you would put the teleporting and transporting avatars and a common payment system. Um, how, do you think we can build something like that and have it widely adopted? 
or do you think that's sort of with the big M metaverse as a holy grail? Uh, I think open standards and agreeing on what those are and agreeing on ownership and how to, how to move people, digital people, digital goods, is important. Uh, giving it all to one specific company feels maybe not, uh, not exactly the direction that we're going. So again, we're going toward this idea of there being some fully funded version of ICANN that isn't owned by anybody that, that controls that part of it. Well, I know, look, we spend lots of time uh, in uh, open standard consortiums mm -hmm. on purpose to try to figure out, you know, what is the way to do this? What is the way to make sure that even anything that you can create with our tools can be carried across uh, anything else? And it's not just up to one company. You, you, you all have to agree that that is, that is possible and that's a possibility. Uh, so you can either do it as a group or you can decide to do it within your own wall garden and, and do it that way. So there's... Something I've been thinking about recently, um, and you know, I think we've talked about the primacy of avatars, we've talked about um, the meta layer, um, but the other thing, and actually meta is the only company I think that's really focusing on this, is your spawn point, right? The spawn point is the new desktop, right? Mm -hmm. Where you materialize in the metaverse in meta's vision is you're kind of in your uh, ideal home if you will, right? It's got, you've got, an, uh, even now when you materialize in uh, a quest, you know, you've got your menu right in front of you, the store or links to social, right? Now they want to add a little home office to it and connect that to uh, work rooms. Why, had, I mean, why didn't Second Life do more with the spawn point, for example? Oh, we certainly did. You did? I mean, if, if by that you mean, I mean, there, there's the, first of all, there's the challenge of when somebody comes in for the very first time, right? That, well, that's that a different point, right, right, of course. Right. But no, absolutely. The, the, the avatars in Second Life are very much physical. So in essence, you know, when you, when you log out and you log back in, you come, well, in many cases, you're going to just kind of come right back to where you were. Uh. And Second Life allows teleporting, which I've always viewed as kind of a mixed thing, um, kind of hard. It kind of introduces other design problems. But the... The, yeah, I mean, the idea that your avatar is a physical thing that moves only slowly, basically, through a physical space is very powerful. It's one of the reasons... Well, that's how you can force so proximity compelling. to matter. And we have neurons in our brains that sense our motion through space that essentially kind of move us through a space. And that's why teleporting is kind of a bad thing. You have to teleport in VR so you don't throw up, right? Most of, most of us have to teleport. But why walk if you can teleport? Because when you walk, you build this mental model that makes the space seem more real to you because you, your brain moves these little mouse neurons, we found them in mice, uh, around as you move through the space. So there is actually, to, to your so point. So you think if there's a photorealistic world, it would be better if we use common locomotion? I, th I believe that the spatial concept of distance is itself a critical component, both of, as you say, the business model of proximity. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm nearby another store, and so I can see that one. If we're to enjoy the metaverse at all, it's because it has some set of remarkable properties that the internet presently doesn't. And as you said, Charlie, the internet is hyperlinks today. You go from one, you know, product on Amazon to another text search. But the value of Second Life and the metaverse, and Second Life big time shows this, is you get all these little stores in a mall or something, and then you're at one, and you see somebody over there that you know, and you go over there, and then you buy something at that store. So that kind of stuff has got to exist in the metaverse, else why are we doing this, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know. I guess I'm lazy. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like walking. And I also think, you know, I'm concerned that the metaverse will be too much like this world. So, you know, it's... it's why is that a concern for you? Well, because I don't need another version of this world. This one is sufficient for me. You know, I, I mean, I want to travel in time. I want to do impossible things. I want to do dangerous things. I want to go places that I would never go. That, so to me, that is the potential value of it. The, but I am concerned that the more photorealistic it gets, uh, the more trouble it can cause. Mm. Um, because people won't know what's real. They won't know which memory was created in a simulation and which memory was created in physical reality. And the implications of that are profound. <laughs> let me make for Charlie, let, let, let me make this small advertisement for anytime you have a, you're thinking deeply about something philosophical like are these memories or are these real people, there's a Black Mirror episode for that. <laughs> so always consult the Black Mirror uh, episode because there's one for every one well, of these issues. It's pop, culture, <laughs> pop culture predicts the future. So we got time for a few questions uh, before we have to wrap up. Um, 
let's see. So I think there are people can ask questions in the room. I see we have some questions from Slido, which I can't read. No, because the oh. lights are um, yeah. Are there any books or specific authors you would recommend for those wanting to get a jump off point to learn more about the metaverse, futurism, uh, Ready Player One, and Snow Crash? What do you think the biggest single uh, technological hurdle is to the metaverse? Alternatively, what is the single <laughs> technological breakthrough that will accelerate the metaverse? Well, I, I want to get to as many questions as possible. I yeah. think we hit that one pretty good. Yeah. Um, People enjoying each other and a lot of people in the same place. Those are two significant uh, technical challenges. What do we think of the metaverse being, oh, this is a good question, inclusive and accessible for underrepresented groups, right? Is the metaverse gonna have an ec economic ec exclusivity to it? Not just economic, right, but governance and behavior as well. Centralized moderation systems tend to serve one customer. That's almost immediately a kind of dystopia, right, because that moderation system is going to favor one kind of person. So if we want to have metaverses that are as, as inclusive uh, and embrace diversity as much as we do in the real world or more, we are going to have to make them um, locally governed in a way where you know, different people can in conflict create a lot of different governance strategies. Well, there's a couple of good questions here, but I don't want to jip people in the room. And I would also say from a creator's perspective, you need to make sure that any creator is able to, to create. So make the tools as right. easy as possible so you're not just left with the super techie ones that can do things and make sure that they have a way of distributing and selling uh, their creations. Uh, so that it's inclusive in that sense too. Otherwise, if, you, if, you, if we're only trying to be inclusive for the users, uh, we still end up putting them in situations that are limiting and not, not inclusive in that way. And avatars and identity is also a part of that. You need to be able to express your identity like you want um, in a virtual world. Otherwise, you don't... You well, here's, here's a good follow-up question right. to that. Um, uh, doesn't the concept of multiple avatars potentially foster an environment of disinformation and catfishing, et cetera. If you can swap realities, nothing is real. Uh, Chris Story, you are absolutely right, and that is what we were talking about earlier. Um, yeah. What happens when you can't tell which memory is real? And, and there's, I mean, there's such a, there's, that is like, talk about that for hours, but if well, you are connected to other people in there, if you are connected to and have rich social bonds community bonds, I live next to Charlie in the metaverse, then you can't do the multiple avatars, swapping out realities, catfishing, as it was said. All of that becomes a lot harder if you have a rich social web. But if you're in a metaverse in which you are largely or even more so than the real world alone, all of these dangers will come up, that and many more, and I believe that they will be very bad. Well, having one regulated identity <clears throat> kind of addresses that. Right. That way, you know, today, if you uh, wanted to rob a bank, you know, your physical body with your physical body in the real world, you are fully accountable and present for that activity. But in the metaverse, not so much. Right. And, and this idea that, you know, you go on Twitter and there are lots of bots, uh, you know, if you're viewing information on the war, you see there are lots of bots and you can't sometimes tell if the person is commenting is real or not. Yeah. So taking that problem into the Charlie metaverse. Was good. Uh, oh, is there not a mic? Yeah, there's, there's no mic, so I got a question. Hi, Nicole. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Nicole. Uh, I have a question on the book. So Neil Stephenson wrote two books? Snow Crash is the book we're talking about. And he also wrote Diamond Age, which, yeah. on the panel, which book do you think is the better vision for our <laughs> That's great. I don't know Diamond Age, so. Love Diamond Age, love Diamond Age. Um, I think it's probably the most engrossing. Most people have told me that's the one that they love the most from Stevenson. I would respond though, Nicole, there is another Stevenson book, which I am a huge fan of, that is more new, that is called Fall, or Dodge in Hell. And Fall contemplates a virtual world that we can only go into by dying physically and being sort of uploaded into it. And then, in which we can have no interaction, but only to watch what's going on inside that world. And that is a fascinating uh, philosophical uh, journey into where we may go next that I would encourage people to check out if you haven't. It's a big uh, book. Leon Jacobs asks, how can tech companies be accountable to build metaverses that are good for society? 
I mean, uh, again, I think it goes back to what's your ethical core, and I think, that, by the way, that's the same thing for if you take a regular person. What's, what's their ethical core? Ethics are, are forgotten. Uh, so if, if you start from the point of making sure that, that you want to take care of users and you want to take care of creators and you follow that path, then you'll make choices that are in line with that. If that's not the case, then you end up with different choices. I think a simple, a really simple answer is companies have to treat virtual spaces as public. We have to start treating virtual spaces as public commons. And that shifts the responsibility that we have as a community, as a government, <clears throat> to doing it differently. We've not done that, as we all know, with the internet. We, the internet is not actually a public commons, which is nonsense, right? And, and so the companies are able to do whatever they want there, be discriminatory, uh, suppress speech in ways that you'd never see, you would never see legally in a public commons. So I think that what, one of the ways we're gonna get to that a safe, safe situation is for all of us to embrace the idea and take seriously that these are real spaces, and therefore that we as governments and communities have to treat them as such and keep them uh, fair and open in the same way that we do spaces in the real world. Okay, we have a couple of humans with questions. <laughs> mm. This is a great panel. Um, developed in Second Life for a very long time, so glad you guys are still around. <laughs> the, the thing that is very important in our future of allowing people to connect is a sense of empathy, right? Mm. The problem with Avatar today, though MetaHumans is really getting there, is the ability to read emotion. And I'm sure Ready Player Me is exploring this. So I'm questioning, how can we teach empathy in a metaverse? I, I, you know, I think one of the problems with uh, the social metaverses that exist now is the lack of eye contact. Right? We were talking about this at dinner. Right. You know, because you can, the reason we have whites in our eyes is evolutionary. It, it gave us empathy. It helped us yeah. to recognize each other trust. You know, and establish trust. Yeah. You know, I would also say that a shared environment, if we are to establish this empathy, if we want metaverses to bring us together in the same way that we do in the real world, there's the avatars being expressive, eye contact, as Charlie said, that's certainly true, but there's a whole other thing, which is sharing a space together intentionally as avatars, and we've seen this big time in Second Life, is a huge part of creating trust and connection between people. So it's not just the avatar, it's where the avatars are, how often you go there, do you go and have coffee with your friend on Wednesday at three in the metaverse? That That's stuff a, matters a lot. That's a commitment to being present. And to creating shared spaces that we enjoy together. Like one of the problems with the metaverse potentially is that it could be this horrifically hallucinogenic thing where we're all experiencing it differently. Like that guy's famous uh, hyper, what is it, hyper reality? Okay, it's, perhaps oh, it's, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, the amazing yeah. uh, uh, video that shows you a world where everybody is seeing all this completely customized garbage. Yeah, if the world looks anything like it looks in the YouTube video, hyper reality, things have gone right, terribly hyper -reality, wrong. Thank you. <laughs> Um, is there a role for governments or UN to be peacekeepers police in the metaverse? Well, this is a companion to a topic that we didn't talk about, which is the role of national borders yeah. in the metaverse, right? I mean, that China um, looks at a very different metaverse. Uh, in Russia, they look at a different, highly regulated metaverse. So you've got three quarters of the people in the world not looking at what we're calling the metaverse. And because of that, I'm not sure the UN can do anything about it. I mean, this is, you know, national borders have been the source and are the source of conflict throughout history. And I don't see a way that that conflict doesn't follow us into the metaverse. I mean, national borders support and protect human bodies, right, for the most part. They are literally, you know, nations are containers that encircle a certain number of people. I think we're going to see, I mean, we've seen this a lot in Second Life, there's a tremendous pressure to establish common standards for things like legal disputes, right? <laughs> in Second Life today, it's still, there's kind of formally, it's still terra incognito even after 20 years right. about, you know, if, if people from two different countries as avatars want to sue each other, whose court they sue each other in. So I think stuff like that will drift. That had court. to come up, right? People had to sue each other in real court over things that happened in Second Life. And that they have many times, yeah. <laughs> and at the same time, you do see the UN even just trying to understand better what right. is it and trying to get advisors that understand the space a little bit better too. Right. To Let's go back to human people, yes? Those 
So it, it, you're asking how NFTs are going to work with the metaverse? Uh, VR VR. In VR headsets. VR. Or how to bring the communities together. The so conflict I, between the VR developer and game development communities and the NFT communities, uh, I which see. are really at odds right now. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it just takes time. And like, uh, ultimately, implementing any technology in your game, in your world, should like make the experience better for end users and, and make it you know, a business that you can run and, and so forth. So I think if uh, NFTs become you know, valuable for, for games, not in VR, or in some VR games that implement NFTs, then they will be in other VR games as well. And right now, it's like a, I don't know, philosophical question. There's a lot of speculation. People don't like that. So there's a lot of like kind of, um, there's a lot of conflict about that. But I think people will just get tired and focus on the value it brings or it doesn't bring. You know, um, we believe in NFTs. Uh, well, let's see. So, uh, next person. We just have a couple minutes. I'm sorry. I just wanted to, everybody who's standing there in the aisle to have a chance. Oh, really good question. Wow. So uh, I think one of the things that's so amazing about the technology of the metaverse, we barely kind of got this working in Second Life, but when we did with like d different uh, sort of tests, it's amazing. You can translate bidirectionally between uh, text to voice, voice to text, and then include, cap include language translation on everybody all the time in the metaverse, which strikes me as one of the opportunities for, and then with regard to sign language, the ability to use your hands in VR devices yeah. is just about now, I think, as of that last hand update from well, Oculus, right, exactly. good enough to allow sign language to work. Um, on, on, and in, and in the, the data gloves are coming, which will track your fingers, and, which I think... And by the way, for example, uh, the metahumans have been used already to learn sign language and figure out how to do it. That's something that, that's already happened. So. Thank, thank you for bringing that up. That's a great topic. Uh, okay, we got one more human and like zero seconds, so... Mm -hmm. You mean you want the metaverse to be more utopian than the world we live in? Mm. Possible? I hope so. <laughs> no ads. <laughs> yeah. I'm a broken record. Yes, it's, gonna, it's possible to make a world. Utopia or dystopia assumes a common user, so I think it's kind of a bad yeah. way to talk about it anyways. But I, but I do think that um, the biggest way to avoid a dystopia is to deal with um, privacy and surveillance and make sure that it's not a part of the experience in any way as we go into these worlds, because the dangers of biometric uh, surveillance, which is probably the yeah. two words we should use, biometric surveillance, are, are too great to be taken. We, we, we can't go down that road. It would be, it would be terrible. Yeah, it would Thank be. you, South by Southwest. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.